And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Dane Clark as star of Till the Day I Die, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Dane Clark in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! I'd practically worn a track in the linoleum. And I was on my third pack of cigarettes in three hours. I was I was jumpy as a three-year-old thoroughbred that's flunked the saliva test. Partly it was because you always feel like that after a job. Partly it was the idea of staying holed up in that crummy dump when I had enough dough now to buy a good-sized hotel, but mostly it was Pat. Ah, she and I were washed up anyway, even if she didn't know it. And when you're washed up with a dame almost... But when it's a kind of belly ache that she was doing, it's enough to get you set for a canvas course. It's it's the future I'm worried about, Frankie. Well, what's the matter with the future? It doesn't look like you'll ever be on any bread lines. No, no, I don't mean that. I mean our future, yours and mine. Well, stop worrying about I it. I can't. You didn't have to do it, Frankie. What do you mean I didn't have to do it? The guy had his cold. We were walking out of the place with a bag full of dough, and all of a sudden he steps around the corner and slaps a light in my face. But you didn't have to kill him. Oh, I suppose I should have given him cab fare to the police headquarters. He'd have put the finger on us. Don't you understand that? He'd have given the description to the cops, and a good description is all those guys need because sooner or later, sister, they get you. I don't know, Frankie. I, I just never figured you'd ever do a thing like that. Ah, stop it. Look, you've been going out on these jobs with me for over a year now. You know what the score is. What do you think we carry a gun for, for looks? Yeah, but this is different, Frankie. This is murder. All right, so it's murder. And the only difference between murder and what you've been doing is that murder gets you the works and armed robbery only gets you 10 to 20. The... Doesn't it even bother you? Well, why should it? A guy I don't know the first thing about. A guy that just had the tough luck to be working late in the joint we stacked out the crack. A guy I, I, I don't even see his face. I don't know what he looks like even now. He was a man, though, Frank. He was a human being. So what? Guys are knocked off every day. Guys you, you don't know anything about, only what you read in the paper. And do you worry about it? You do not. I don't like it, Frankie. I don't like any part of it. Uh, but you like that 50 grand in the suitcase over there. You like that all right, don't you? I'm not so sure, Frankie. Oh, I'm not so sure. Because I was in on this, too. Maybe you don't have a conscience, but I do. A man was murdered, and it was partly my fault. You don't just brush off a thing like that, Frank. Sooner or later, it, it begins to work on you. Sooner or later, it, it begins to catch I up said with you. shut up! And when it does, you... Oh! Now, forget it, will you? Oh. I'm sorry I hit you. Look, I, I, I'm a little nervous now. Pull yourself together, will you? Anyway, it's time to go out and get the papers. Come on, come on. Run down for him like a good kid, will you? All right. And see if you can give me a couple of packs of cigarettes while you're at it. All right, Frankie. And stop worrying. Nothing's going to happen. I can't help it, Frankie. Listen, Pat. Yeah? I don't like you to worry, see? Because you might get ideas. What do you mean, ideas? I mean you might get some ideas about saying something to somebody. Oh, Frankie. And you know what would happen if you did get any ideas like that? You don't need to worry. Because I do know now. I went over to the window and I watched her go down the steps to the street and then start for the corner. I knew I didn't have to worry about anything yet, but having somebody around who can put the finger on you for a murder rap isn't so healthy. I was just starting on my fourth pack of cigarettes when I heard her running up the stairs. All right, all right. Hurry, hurry up, Frankie. Open the door. All right. Well, you don't have to knock the... What's the matter? Somebody after you? No. No, but look at the paper. Let's see. Oh, front page, huh? P. 
hair loot brokerage uh, office. Uh, no, the picture. Well, what about the pi- It's me. It's me. Listen, Pat, there's only one place in the world they could have got a picture of me. No, don't listen, Frankie, you... don't you? You're hurting me. Look what it says. What about it? Look at it. Look what it says under it. Huh? Philip Abel, accountant, shot down... No. It couldn't be. It, it, it can't be. It is, though, Frankie. It's the man you killed. It couldn't be, I tell you. Why, that's me. It's exactly like me any way you look at it, even the way the hair is parted. Look. It... Why, it's some kind of a mistake or something. You know it isn't, Frankie. How could it be? I don't know. It's... I don't have any picture of you. You told me you never had any taken. You said you'd been smart. You hadn't let him take your picture since you were a kid. Yeah, that's right. I never did. I. But it's almost exactly like me. I, I couldn't tell the difference myself. Uh, it's just one of those freak things. <laughs> the guy you didn't know or care about. The guy who wasn't going to bother your conscience one little bit. The guy you killed turns out to be your double. Yeah. It's... Sort of like killing yourself. Shut up. I told you, it's not so easy to kill a Come man on, without... Come on, give me that paper. Frankie, listen, what are you trying to do? I'm tearing up that picture, see? And now, I'm burning it. See? And it's over with. It's forgotten, see? It's nothing but a little pile of ashes. I never heard of the guy. I don't know the first thing about him. I don't even remember his name. I do, it was... Shut up! I don't want to hear about it. Ever. Maybe I should have let her talk about it then when she wanted to. If I'd really got to thinking about the face in that picture, it might have made some difference. I don't know. It might have saved my life, but... I, I don't know. <laughs> Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Dane Clark in Till the Day I Die, a radio play by Martin Ryerson. Roma Wines presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Ken Niles with a friendly suggestion. Now that summer is over, this is the time when friends drop by to say hello again and swap vacation yarns with you. Make these evenings of friendly companionship rich in hospitality by serving a delicious Roma wine. Yes, a glass of Roma California sherry, port, or muscatel does taste good. And with Roma wines on hand, you're always tastefully prepared for unexpected guests. Because delicious Roma wines lend an air of graciousness and goodwill to the most casual get-togethers. You know, there's a solid reason why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. That reason is finer taste. The finer taste of Roma wine is born in California's richest vineyards. There, each year, a vast, juice-laden treasure of choice grapes is patiently, unhurriedly guided to tempting perfection by Roma's unmatched skills and resources. Then, along with Roma wines of years before, this treasure of taste awaits selection from the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. No wonder so many Americans insist on Roma, R-O-M-A. Roma Wines, for unvarying goodness at reasonable cost. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Dane Clark in Till the Day I Die, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I won't say it didn't get under my skin, because it did. To bump a guy off... And then to see his picture in a paper the next day. And it's a picture of yourself. Feature for feature. The spitting image. I guess it would get anybody. But it was like Pat said, just one of those freak things. So what was the use of worrying about it? What was worrying me more right now was that somebody must have seen us making our getaway because the cops knew it was a man and a woman who pulled the job. And that wasn't good. It meant that we were just that much easier to spot it meant that 
With 50 grand in a suitcase under the bed, we still had to stay cooped up in that crummy rooming house day after day waiting for the heat to slack off. And finally, I couldn't stand it any longer. Yeah, but Frankie, I thought you said... I know, I know what I said, but I'm going nuts in this place. I I, I got to get out. All right. It'll mean we have to separate for a while. Separate? Now, keep your shirt on, will you? We can't hang around here, so one of us goes to Chicago and the other one goes to Philly. You take your share of the dough and Uh, I... I I don't want any share, Frankie. Are you still beefing about that? That I killed a guy? I just don't want the money, All right, all right. Take a couple of grand and anything you want, enough to last you a while. But you're getting out of town, see? All right, Frank. But I got enough money. Okay, okay. Have it your way. You go to the Allerton in Philly. You know the place now. And you wait for me there. For how long, Frankie? A month, two months. How do I know? Until it cools off. But I'll get in touch with you. And when the, and when the heat's off, we'll meet someplace like uh, KC or St. Louis. Or, and, and then we'll head for the West Coast, right? Frankie. Yeah? You won't forget to show, will you, Frankie? Because if you're going to, I'd, I'd rather know it now. Forget you, baby? When you're the one person in the world who can put the finger on me for murder? Don't worry, baby. I won't forget you. I walked Pat to the subway station a couple of blocks from where the room was, and I said goodbye to her there. Then I bought me a couple of... Uh, ready to wear suits, a few shirt shoes, and the rest of the trimmings, and I stuffed everything in a brand new Gladstone and hopped the bus for the railroad terminal. I wasn't doing anything or thinking anything. I was just sitting there in a bus on a seat all by myself, looking out the window, and up front somewhere, the kid was hollering, and I, I didn't pay any attention to him. I figured the kid was just calling to his old man to come and sit down or something. And I went right on looking out the window. And then all of a sudden... I felt a tug on my sleeve, and the kid was there hollering at me. Daddy! Oh, Mommy, come quick! I found Daddy! I turned around quick, and kneeling there beside me on the seat was a, a blonde, curly-haired kid about four or maybe five years old. I, I, I don't know much about kids' ages. <laughs> he was laughing, and yet there was big tears running down his cheeks. I, I, I don't go much for kids, but there was something about this particular character that... Daddy! Daddy! It's Daddy, Mommy. Hey, now, wait a minute. Just a second, kiddo. I'm afraid you got... Hey, what's got into you jumping up on that seat and shouting at the gentleman? It's Daddy, Mommy. It's my Daddy. Daddy. I'm awfully sorry, sir. Oh, no. She was standing there. Just like I'd seen her a million times. With that long blonde hair and those big expressive eyes. Yes, I'd seen her before. But always with my eyes closed. This was the first time I'd ever seen her with my eyes open. Is it so crazy? Haven't you got some kind of a person in your mind that you've always dreamed about? Her eyes were fastened on my face, wide and full of expression. I I, I couldn't figure it. But she got very pale and and licked her lips, and then she began to sway, and I jumped up and I grabbed her. I'm all right. No, look, you're not all right. You better sit down here. Thank you. Maybe I will. Sit here, Mommy. I'll move over. That's this... Gentlemen, you see, Teddy. Oh, that's okay, Kitty. You stay put. There's, there's plenty of room here for the three of us. All right, if you insist. Well, I do insist. It is, Daddy, isn't it, Mommy? No. No, darling, I'm afraid it isn't. I'm so sorry. You must think we're both a little insane. No, I... I uh, only you looked for a minute there as if you saw a ghost or something. I'm afraid for a moment I thought you were a ghost. Me? A ghost? Yes, I... No, it sounds perfectly ridiculous, but for a moment there, I... I thought you were my husband. Oh, oh, n- now I get that daddy routine. Yes, it's, it's almost uncanny, but he was the image of you, the very image. The, uh, image of me? Yeah, only... See, he's dead. Huh? Teddy hasn't quite gotten used to the idea yet. That's why he mistook you for his daddy. Philip was killed only about a week ago. About a week ago? Yes. Perhaps you read about it in the newspapers. Philip Abel, killed by a hoodlum who was robbing the brokerage office where he worked. There was a terrible knot inside my stomach. I tried to speak, but the words got lost somewhere in my throat. I looked down at the kid with the blonde, curly hair, the cutest kid I'd ever seen in my life, and I... 
I was a guy who killed his daddy. And I kept thinking, this kid is what my kid would have looked like. I had to get a grip on myself. All right, so it was a coincidence. I happened to get on the same bus with the wife of the guy I shot down in the bank, but how was I supposed to know he had a beautiful wife and a curly-haired kid when I shot him? To me, he was just a Joe who stood in my way. So it was a coincidence, that's all. Anyway, I, I, I was getting off the bus at the end of the line, catching a train for Chicago, and that would be that. Well, they rode almost as far as the railroad station, and we sat there and we talked about a lot of different things. And it wasn't hard to talk to her somehow. And that kid. And then finally, they were getting up to leave. And then the kid reached up, and he did something no kid had ever done to me before. He kissed me. If you ever come back to this place, Mr. Kane, we live right down this block, seventh house from the corner. I'll remember that. Goodbye, Mr. Daddy. Uh, goodbye, son. I bought my ticket for Chicago one way. I went down and got aboard the train, and the porter showed me my seat. But I couldn't get myself to sit down in it. I went out and stood on the platform. I stood there a long time. I tried not to think about her. I tried not to remember her face and the kid's face with all those tears. But it was no good. There was everything I've wanted all my life. A home, a kid, and the right girl. The girl. And why not? If she'd married Abel, she'd marry me, wouldn't she? Wasn't I the very image of the guy? Didn't she say that herself? Didn't the kid even call me daddy? Why not? Porter! Yes, sir? Hey, uh, get my bag. Well, we're getting ready to pull out. Get my bag off this train. Yes, sir. What? Why, Mr. K? Oh. Hi, Teddy. Hi. Oh, gee. Well, I thought you were on your way to Chicago. Uh, uh, there was a wire waiting for me when I got to the station that uh, told me that the business deal I had there had been called off, so there wasn't any need of me going. So, and then I remembered your invitation, so I... <laughs> Certainly never expected it to be filled so soon. Well, if it's too soon, I'll, I'll, I'll go oh, and don't I'll... Don't be silly. Come in, please. Gee, I'm glad you're home. I... I mean... I went into the house and was everything I knew it would be. Neat, well furnished, nothing overdone, just a real solid home. And we went into the living room and there in a big silver frame on the Braby Grand Piano was the same picture that had appeared in the newspaper. A picture of him. That's Philip. He does look like you, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He does. Quite a lot. You can hardly blame Teddy very much, can you, or... Me? No, I... I guess I can't. After those first few uneasy moments, I... I guess you could say everything settled down to routine. I became a regular visitor. She and Teddy called me Frank, and I called her Barbara, and I... I had dinner with her a couple of times a week, and we went to the movies and the shows and even a couple of night spots together. But I feel funny about moving in on a wife and a kid of a guy I killed. Why should I? The guy was still a total stranger to me, wasn't he? And whenever she brought up the subject, I just ducked it. And she wasn't bringing it up so often now. From now on, it was just a matter of time. Except for one thing. One little thing. So about two months after I met her, I told her how I had to go away on business. Where, Frank? Do you have to go far? Oh, just to Philly, that's all. Philadelphia, that's not far. No, and, uh, uh, Barbara. Yes? When I come back, there's... Something I'd like to ask you. Ask me? Yeah. Uh, a question. What kind of a question, Frank? Oh, something about you and Teddy and me. Oh. Well, will you be gone long? No. What I got to do in Philly won't take long. I knew the Allerton Hotel in Philly like I knew the inside of my hat. I knew how to get in without being seen and how to get out without being seen. So I just went up to her room. Who is it? 
Just an old friend. Frankie. Hi, baby. Oh, Frank. <laughs> well, take it easy, will you? Take it easy. Yeah, no. You want to let me in? Oh, sure. Sure, come on in. Oh, Frankie, I thought you'd... I thought maybe you wouldn't. Yeah, but I did, didn't I? Sure you did. Gee, you look great. You look relaxed and happy. Yeah, I'm happy. And what have you been doing with yourself, Pat? Oh, just waiting. Well, nice and private here. Yeah. I guess we better get it over with. Get what over with? I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, Pat. Bad news? Yeah. I'm going to have to kill you. Kill me? Oh, oh Frankie, you always did have a lousy sense of humor. Only don't kid that way. Yeah. Oh, I'm not kidding. Frankie, put away that gun. For heaven's sake. Uh, sorry, Pat. But why? What have I done? Nothing yet. Well, then... You see, Pat, I, uh... I met a girl. All right, all right, take her. But you'll come back. No, 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 this is different. She's the wife, uh... Was the wife of a guy named Philip Abel. Philip Abel? That... That's the man you killed. You see, Pat, you got too good a memory. But I wouldn't talk, Frankie. You know I wouldn't talk. That's a chance I can't take, Pat, because from now on I'm not taking any chances. From now on, I'm going to be happy. Happy? How could a thing like you be happy? A cold-blooded butcher like you. You think all you got to do is spill enough blood around and you'll get what you want, you'll be happy. Happy, try and be happy with all the blood you've got on your hands. You'll never be happy until the day you die. Through? Yeah. Go ahead. Kill me. Murderer. I will. I was back that same night, but I didn't go around to see Barbara until the next day. I called and she asked me over to dinner. And afterwards, I helped her put the kid to bed and he kissed me goodnight. Then I sat down with her on a couch in the front room. Well, Frank? It's about that question that I told you I was going to ask you when I came back. What is the question, Frank? It's, um... Uh, Barbara, will you marry me? Oh. Well, is that all you got to say? Well, no. No, it isn't. But, but what? Well, I've got to have a little time to think about it, Frank. Think about it? Yes. <laughs> well, you must have known I was going to ask you. Yeah, I, I, I suppose I did, but it's still a pretty serious question to answer just like that, Frank. Well, is, is it that you don't love me enough to marry me? Is that it? It's not just a question of myself. Well, what is it, then? It's Teddy. Teddy? Why? Why? why he's crazy about well, me. I know he is, but things are easy, simple for a child. I'm the one who has to think about his future. Well, I can take care of his future. Well, I know you can financially. I believe that, but... Well, what other way is there? Well, that's what I sometimes wonder if you know, Frank. You see, you're a, you're a little different from other men I've known. You, From a little rougher mold, a little harder. Well, I can be changed. I could... Yes, I, I think you can, but I want to be sure first, Frank. I want to be sure that Teddy's father, his second father, isn't just a successful man, but that he's a good man. Like his first father? Yeah. And what did he have that I don't have? Mm -hmm. Since you ask, he had a lot of struggle in his life. Oh, struggle. He was a successful public accountant when he died... But it hadn't been easy for him. He'd, he'd had to work his way through college. He was an orphan. He'd been adopted, you see. Real name was Lundine. Lundine? Mm hmm. His real parents were killed in an accident when he was less than Teddy's age. They, they lived on a farm in a little town called Hemley, Vermont. Farm in Hemley, Vermont? Yes. Do you know the place? Lundine. Mm hmm. When he was adopted by a family called Abel, he didn't even remember it himself. He was too small, but they told it. Frank. Frank, where are you going? Frank! Frank! 
I started walking. I tried to put it out of my mind like I had everything else. But it was no good. It grew and grew until my head was bursting with it. Until it was the only thing in the whole world that thing she told me. So when I got back to my room, I knew what I was going to have to do. And I sat down to write this. To tell her before I do it. It wasn't just what I'd done. It wasn't realizing that a man with another man's blood on his hands can't be a fit father to that man's kid. Or a fit husband to that man's wife. It was what she had told me. A kid named Lundine. A farm in Hemley, Vermont. And I remembered. I knew now why I looked like Philip Abel. Because I had a... I had been a kid named Lundine. On a farm in Hemley, Vermont. I had been adopted by a family named Cain, and I'd grown up. But in reform schools, mostly. And I'd lived to shoot and kill a man named Philip Abel. Who was my twin. Who was my brother. The gun is by my hand. Pat said, I'd never be happy until the day I died. <laughs> I guess she was kind of right at that. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now, here is our distinguished star of tonight's suspense play, Dane Clark, and our producer-director, William Spear, carrying a huge basket of Roma Wines. As Frankie the Killer, you deserve the cruel fate which just overtook you. I'm glad that you're dead, you rascal. But as Dan Clark, the actor, I think you deserve a handsome present for a very fine performance. So here it is. A basket of fine Roma wines from Roma and me, Dan. Well, thank you, Bill. And while we're tossing compliments around, it so happens that Suspense is my favorite radio show and that you're my favorite producer. And that Roma, my favorite wine. Uh, let's see if uh, Roma Sherry is here. Uh, ah, there it is. <laughs> oh, uh, say, Dane, are you having dinner at home this evening? Yeah, I am. Can a late dinner with a few friends after the show. Well, you'll find, along with all of Hollywood's famous hosts, that Roma California Sherry is the perfect first call for dinner. Of course, it's the favorite of millions everywhere, anytime. It's the ideal wine for afternoon or evening parties. Yes, at any time, there is no other wine so good in so many tasty ways as fragrant golden amber Roma Sherry with its tempting nut-like taste. I'll go along with you on that, Ken. Ah, but you, do you know why all this is true, Dan? Uh, of course, there are reasons why delicious Roma Sherry is so good. You see, only Roma, America's foremost vintner, selects for your enjoyment from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. And because Roma's vast winemaking resources are unmatched anywhere, Roma Sherry, like every Roma wine, is better tasting always. So, ladies and gentlemen, for gracious hospitality at your next party or simple evening at home, serve Roma, Roma wine, largest selling wine in all history. Well, Dane, how are the Warner Brothers these days? Oh, they're fine. Of course, I've been seeing more of the Davis sisters. Betty and Betty, you mean, in The Stolen Life? You were fine in that picture, Dane. As my Aunt Judy says, you took off your part real good. Oh, my compliments to your Aunt Judy. <laughs> uh, who's for suspense next Thursday, Bill? Well, next week it's a story about an unfortunate but murderous-minded clerk, an accountant, who uh, does what many a downtrodden employee must have often at least considered doing. He kills his boss. Our star will be Gene Lockhart. I think you'll like it. It's, uh, it's quite a character study. Well, I'll certainly catch it next Thursday, Bill. And thanks again for everything. Oh, by the way, uh, Bill, thanks so much for having Kathy Lewis and Betty Lou Gerson on the show with me tonight. I think they're wonderful. They are indeed. Good night, Dan. Next Thursday, same time, hear Gene Lockhart in Suspense. Presented by the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. In the following weeks, Suspense will present such stars as Judy Garland, Rita Hayworth, and Edward G. Robinson. 
Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.